My name is Michelle Nilongoin and I'm the president of the Law Society of Ireland. And I'd like to welcome you all to this Law Society webinar. I'm honored to host this all too very relevant webinar where our panel will discuss the war in Ukraine from a legal perspective, the importance of upholding the rule of international law and what lawyers in Europe can do to help. It goes without saying that these are extraordinary times globally. The power and perhaps the limitations of the rule of international law is under the microscope. Our fundamental obligation as lawyers is to uphold the rule of law. Many of you may have read the Law Society's recent statement condemning the invasion of Ukraine by Russia at the outset. We maintain that the rule of law, the protection of human rights, and the principles of democracy must be upheld. And we support a swift and a lawful end to this conflict. In a slight change to the programme today, our keynote speaker, Anna Babich, has experienced flight delays today and is unable to attend, but we are very pleased to welcome Anna's colleague, Yulia Kirpa. Yulia is executive partner and head of banking and finance, insolvency and restructuring capital markets group at ECO based in Ukraine. It is a great honor to have Yulia with us today. And we thank her so much for stepping in at such very short notice, so professionally. And um, we look forward to hearing Yulia's insider perspective, its testimony really, on the current situation in Ukraine. So now if I can just flag some housekeeping points. This event is being recorded just to let you know that. And attendees are encouraged to ask questions through the Q&A function on Zoom, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. And I will read contributions submitted through the Q&A aloud. And please indicate in your question if you don't wish for your name to be read aloud alongside the question. If we don't get to all questions today, which I think is very possible, we will follow up after the event. And if you've any issue with Zoom throughout the event, please use the chat and raise your hand functions to speak to a member of our team. So now on to the webinar itself. I've been inviting Yulia to turn on your video, which is on now, but also to unmute your microphone, Yulia. And as I said earlier, Yulia Kirpa is an executive partner at ECO in Ukraine. She's regarded as one of, one of the best lawyers in the European legal market. And Yulia continuously advises major IFIs and commercial banks, as well as top corporations on financing, capital markets and debt restructuring mandates. She represents the European Commission, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, IFC, KFW, Refeisen Bank International, ING, Dragon Capital, Goldman Sachs, Soros Fund Management, Fitch Ratings and others. And Julia has unparalleled experience in advising on M&A in the Ukrainian financial sector and has advised on the most such transactions between financial institutions in Ukraine to date. She's also a driver of the fintech industry group at the firm. And moreover, Yulia is highly experienced in real estate and construction practices, including transactions with significant real estate element, and has worked on most complex real property acquisition trans transactions in Ukraine. So Yulia, you're very welcome, and I'll hand over to you now. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much, Michelle, for so kind words and so um, nice introduction. I hope uh, that um, the war will be over soon and my expertise will be needed again to, to help Ukraine in some future projects and future developments. Today, I wanted to share with the Law Society the presentation which I prepared describing the current uh, state of affairs in Ukrainian legal industry. This uh, presentation is based on the survey which was done by Ukrainian Bar Association during the wartime. So uh, we can move to the next uh, slide, which would show some statistics. Basically, uh, after the 24th of February, Ukrainian Bar Associations approached Ukrainian law firms to understand the state of affairs and how they were surviving these times of immense challenges for Ukraine and even for the entire world. Basically, all law firms in Ukraine confirmed that none of them work in full. 
according to various responses, the amount of work which is still in place does not exceed 10-20% compared to the pre-war level. So it's really difficult to keep operations, to keep lawyers engaged, to keep paying salaries and still save legal businesses. However, most of law firms, they combine work with volunteering activities. Basically, most of them work uh, during normal business hours and volunteer outside of business hours, which means that their actual working day lasts for 16, 18, 20 hours sometimes. And all of my friends, all of my uh, people from my close circle in Ukraine who stayed in Ukraine, they do the same. Many uh, colleagues, many lawyers, they um, joined um, territorial defense forces or they joined Ukrainian army. Speaking about ECWO, we have uh, three uh, persons who are conscripts and they now serve their military duty. So ECWO as a law firm also did maximum to support them with uh, bulletproof uh, vests, with some defense uh, weapons and everything that we could obtain abroad, we also acquired and delivered to Ukraine to increase for our colleagues who serve in the army chances for surviving. Also, we supported all our colleagues who joined territorial defense forces. And basically the difference between the actual army and territorial defense is that territorial defense represents the second line of resistance, which is also important because those people are non-qualified soldiers and they um, protect and defend qualified soldiers from other attacks of Russian spies who have been working in Ukraine undercover for a decade. And, well, they protect some uh, critical infrastructure objects, they protect civilians and so on. So both efforts of the army and uh, territorial defense forces, they are hugely important. And we um, did our best and keep doing everything we can to support them with uh, weapons, um, with uh, defense supply, um, medical supply and humanitarian aid supply. So this is, uh, and that's how most of Ukrainian law firms are surviving now. Most of them uh, keep working, um, still um, supporting remaining and residual projects, but 30%, as you can see on the slide, 30% of law firms already completely stopped their operations. Now we can move on. In order to um, keep businesses operational to the extent possible, it was necessary to relocate the entire legal teams to the areas where it's safe to work in the current environment. Most of Ukrainian law firms have them head offices in Kiev or in big cities uh, where um, it was not possible to work without any interruptions because even in Kiev, sirens kept working 20 hours a day. So um, people who stayed in Kiev tried to work from bomb shelters for the first three, four days. And then it became obvious that sirens never stopped and uh, it was not possible to continue working from bomb shelters within two or three weeks. Because basically, if you were in Kiev within the last uh, three, two weeks, you had to be in bomb shelter literally all the time. That's why uh, Ukrainian law firms relocated their teams to the Western uh, Ukraine. And most of them keep uh, remote offices in the Western part of Ukraine now, which allows to support uh, some business which is still ongoing. Most of the law firms responded 
46% responded, as you can see on the slide, that they helped with the relocation of their teams. And 21% of Ukrainian law firms said that they relocated 100 of their employees. ECWO also relocated 100 of our personnel. We managed to relocate our female part to Czech Republic to make sure that um, those colleagues uh, keep working and assisting Ukraine through other uh, means um, without any interruptions. And a male part of our law firm now works uh, from safe places in the Western Ukraine because Ukrainian men are not allowed to cross the border as they uh, could be called um, to serve their military duty anytime, depending on, on the priority and their previous experience. So the law firm is um, physically divided into two parts and um, practically we keep operating uh, online like we also all learned to do during a pandemic. And um, most of law firms in Kiev, which is the capital, don't um, operate at all. And the same applies to the law firms in the eastern part of Ukraine. Those who did not relocate uh, when it was still possible, they were forced to stop all the operations. So relocation helped a lot. And I am also thankful to 46% of my colleagues in the legal market who took care of their teams. Then can, yes. Also, I wanted to discuss briefly secondment opportunities and secondment as a problem. Uh, we all uh, read in the news and find the information that many Western law firms uh, provided secondment opportunities for Ukrainian law firms to support them in these extremely difficult times. As a matter of fact, while Ukrainian lawyers were asked whether any of them received proposals for secondment, 83% of respondents said that they did not receive any secondment offer for their lawyers at all. S some said that they would like to receive at least an information about secondment opportunities, but they did not receive any information too. And 38% of law firms started thinking about opening of their office abroad to keep doing some uh, business activities which are still ongoing and which would arise again after the war. Basically, if anyone wants to uh, help with secondment option and thinks that Ukrainian lawyers could be used in some cross-border projects, I think that would be very much appreciated by the entire legal uh, community in Ukraine, as the survey shows. The next slide, please. This slide represents also workload and income figures. Uh, and as you can see, 17% of the firms uh, mentioned that they do not have any reserve fund at all, while 40% said that they have reserves sufficient for three, four months of their operations to keep paying salaries to the personnel. And 87% of respondents said that the workload of the firm decreased significantly by more than 30%. Uh, the survey was done two weeks after the war started. So by now, I think this figure is much, um, it, it looks much worse. It's not um, more than 30%, but firms already admit that the workload decreased by more than 50 and sometimes 70 and 80%. Uh, so the more the war gets delayed, the more difficult it is to keep any workload because um, courts work in a limited way uh, and the all transactions are on hold at the moment. So that's the situation. However, despite the financial difficulties and um, huge uh, decrease 
of revenue, which the law firms experienced. 80% of law firms management said that they provide financial support to the state and the army. Basically, most of uh, partners of the law firm do it uh, using their own savings, their own funds. As revenue streams for the law firms don't allow now even to pay salaries to people uh, longer than three, four months, which most of them still have as a grace period using the reserve fund. And so partners had to step in and finance support of Ukrainian army and territorial defense forces, as well as to support uh, their colleagues who were enrolled in, in the army and other defense units. And every second person participates in the information war, meaning that people keep sharing information, uh, make, make, they keep making some posts on Facebook and LinkedIn, they do fundraising, they coordinate through social networks, many um, ways and streams to support Ukraine from finding necessary equipment abroad to actually making sure that humanitarian aid is delivered safely and timely. This is the uh, war and the volunteer initiative, which every second lawyer in Ukraine supports and is heavily involved in now. And the last um, slide I devoted to potential opportunities how to help Ukraine, because we receive many questions from our foreign colleagues about the best ways to help. First of all, the entire Ukrainian uh, society, legal society, would appreciate any assistance in attracting clients, any referrals, any possibility for Ukrainian lawyers to work on cross-border projects where our expertise can be applied. If any of uh, foreign law firms are ready to consider secondment options, this would also be very much welcomed by Ukrainian legal community. And also we would appreciate assistance with any legislative activities which are relevant during the war and martial law times, because it's clear that securities which existed in the past, they don't address the problems which Ukraine experiences today and the new system of international guarantees and international securities has to be elaborated. Also, um, our colleagues from other law firms highlighted and they confirmed their view in the survey that any exemptions from membership fees by IBA and free participation in international legal events would also be appreciated. And we know that IBA waived all the fees when uh, special requests were provided. And I, I, I am aware that our membership fee for 2022 was waived. And my uh, partners also were granted free participation in international legal events. I would only uh, like to ask you to support those requests from Ukrainian legal community if you keep uh, receiving further requests on this matter, because um, most of law firms are now solving uh, the biggest challenge uh, during 30 years of Ukraine's independence. They are trying to survive and uh, not to uh, lay people off as long as possible. They try to keep their teams, to keep operations and uh, in order to be, be able to support Ukraine after the war. So if you can assist with that, that would also be very much appreciated by the entire legal community. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Julia. That was a um, very insightful and uh, powerful perspective um, to bring to us all today, and we really appreciate it. I look forward now to discussing that with our distinguished panel. And on that note, I'd like to invite our panelists to turn on their videos, but keep their microphones muted for a moment as I introduce you both. Thank you. So the first up is James McGuill, Senior Counsel. 
James is president of the Council of Bars and Law Societies of Europe, the CCBE. And of course, he's also a past president of the Law Society of Ireland for the term 2007 to 2008. James is managing partner at McGuill and Company, having been admitted to the role of solicitor in 1986 and was appointed a notary public in 1996. James has been in private practice ever since as a litigator with an emphasis on public law, especially criminal law. And his practice includes domestic and international cases, both within and outside the European Union. James represents clients before all European courts. He has been actively involved in the Law Society of Ireland and has chaired many of its committees, um, including as relevant to this anti-money laundering um, committee where he's a lot of experience. And James joined the CCB in 2008, where he was head of the Irish delegation and later chair of its criminal law committee until January 2019. And also joining us, thank you, is, is Gary Lee. Um, Gary is the managing solicitor of Ballymun Community Law Centre. Gary is also an elected Law Society Council member and he chairs the Law Society's Human Rights and Equality Committee. And Gary is also a chairperson of mental health tribunals. Gary is the immediate past chairperson of the Disability Federation of Ireland and has been appointed by government to various committees, to work groups and task forces over the years. And Gary's work is very focused on empowering people and, and communities. So now if I can, if I can start the discussion, I'd ask all panelists to unmute their microphones, please. And then I'm going to start with our very first question. And that is, what are some examples of violations of international law and any examples that you think of? Might any of those apply to the current situation in Ukraine? And I'm going to ask you, Yulia, first in relation to that, please. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, first of all, Ukraine expected that uh, Budapest Memorandum which Ukraine, uh, Great Britain, USA, and Russian Federation signed in 1994, when Ukraine voluntarily gave up its third biggest nuclear potential in the world, that it would be not a just a piece of paper, that it work automatically and would allow Ukraine receive a huge protection from all countries who used to be guarantors. Uh, we were quite surprised that um, despite the Budapest memorandum in place, uh, we received the rejection from USA, Great Britain and NATO countries to close the sky over Ukraine, which was explained by the desire to avoid um, direct confrontation and conflict with Russia. In our view, a Budapest memorandum guaranteed that and all uh, types of protection including introduction of a no-fly zone over Ukraine. So this is the first point which I wanted to raise about the violation of international treaties. And the second point, which is also huge, is complete breach of uh, Geneva conventions by Russian Federation. Geneva conventions uh, comprise three protocols which uh, provide protection to civilians, to wounded people, and sick people uh, living in or around war zones. And all of those norms and provisions are completely disregarded by Russian Federation. They keep killing civilians on purpose, including women, children, infants, elderly people, disabled people on wheelchairs, and they um, absolutely don't comply with um, Geneva Conventions governing um, appropriate behavior during war times. And last but not least, Russia also completely disregarded the decision of the UN Court of Justice, which required Russia to stop immediately the war against Ukraine, which also leads um, as to conclusion about huge breach of all international conventions, international norms, and um, lead us to conclusion that a new uh, set of documents, a new set of securities, and a new approach to enforcement of international court orders would be needed in the future. Thank you, Yulia. And Gary, is there anything you'd like to add there? 
Yes, President, uh, if I could just say at the outset, uh, Yulia, I mean, our hearts go out to the Ukrainian people for the appalling atrocities being per perpetrated upon you. I mean, there, that's what this is. This war is, is an atrocity. There's no legal basis whatsoever for Russia to have invaded uh, Ukraine. Um, the war is illegal and the war must stop now. Um, and Russia is blatantly, blatantly in violation of, of, of international law. Um, and I, a number of colleagues um, that knew that I was coming on today have got in touch with me to express their solidarity and support for, for Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. I mean, where do we start in terms of, of the violations uh, that, have been, that have been carried out? I mean, war itself, of course, is prohibited except in self-defense. I mean, and that's expressly provided for in the uh, UN Charter. Um, as Yulia was saying, the, the, the Geneva Conventions uh, that govern uh, the rules of war um, and, and should provide protections for, for civilians, uh, prisoners of war and uh, prisoners of war and, and others um, are being completely disregarded from the reports that we see coming out of, of, of Ukraine. Um, and expressly, the, the Geneva Conventions expressly prohibit uh, the targeting of civilians or civilian property. Um, during, uh, during, during war. Um, there's also a number of international uh, treaties that would be applicable here, including the uh, European Convention on Human, on Human Rights, um, the International Covenant on Civil, Civil and Political Rights, the Convention Against uh, Torture, uh, and so on. We also have the, the Rome Statute, um, and that's, that establishes, of course, the, the International Criminal Court. Um, so the ICC has jurisdiction to investigate and prosecute crimes against humanity and war crimes. And if these war crimes, and this is very important, if these war crimes are committed as part of a plan or a policy or large scale commission of war crimes, then there's the potential to go after the leadership. Um, and as, as I'm sure uh, everybody knows by now, the chief prosecutor of the ICC, uh, Karim Khan, commenced an investigation into the alleged uh, war, uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity in, in Ukraine. And Lithuania were actually very quick off the mark to put in a complaint to the ICC as well. And 38 countries quickly followed suit, including, in, including Ireland. Um, so this, in fact, would be an extension of the, of the ICC's existing ongoing uh, in, investigation into uh, the invasion of, of, uh, of Ukraine, uh, Ukraine's southern peninsula of Crimea and, and eastern Ukraine. Um, and as soon as the war, as, as Russia started the war, uh, indeed, some might say that the actual war started in 2014 and not in, in, in 2022. But as soon as, uh, we'd say maybe as soon as the war intensified um, on the 24th of February, Ukraine itself made a complaint to the uh, International Court of Justice. And that's the court established by the, um, the, the United Nations Charter, and that settles international uh, disputes between, between states. I mean, as regards inter the breaches of specific breaches, other breaches of international law, I mean, well, as I said, the war itself is a breach. Um, we're hearing reports of widespread attacks on, on civilian infrastructure, schools and hospitals, widespread bombing of residential areas, the use of cluster bombs in, in civilian areas to maximize casualties. Um, we have seen the city of Bari Upal practically razed to the, to the ground. And there's reports now coming out of dreadful abuses and executions of, of civilians. Civilians trying to leave a war zone have been deliberately targeted. I mean, if any of these are, are, are proven, uh, they would constitute uh, war, uh, war crimes. Gary, thank you so much. I think you've, you've spoken for us all in terms of the, the strength of feeling that we have in, in hearing Yulia today and the importance as lawyers um, to, to see the, the abhorrent breaches um, of legal obligations. Um, James, can I ask you to come in from a, a CCBE perspective and also maybe if, if there's anything you want to mention in terms of breaches of domestic law as well? Yes, <clears throat> President, uh, the first thing I'd like to say to <clears throat> Yulia is that I've never seen such unity of purpose among our European colleagues in wanting to stand by our colleagues in Ukraine. And by coincidence, we had a meeting of our standing committee on the 25th of February. And we're a very rule um, governed body. We can't do much about uh, un unanimity, but there was unanimity to condemn uh, the legal acts of Putin and his accomplices. And at that time, we were looking 
the first reaction was to look at the International Criminal Court because clearly the conduct we were hearing of the attacks on civilians is exactly as, as Gary has indicated. If they fall within a categories of, of war crimes, and I won't repeat that. Um, what we've learned of in, in recent days means it's much worse than we even feared at the beginning. So we have huge sympathy for the people of Ukraine. But uh, I'm pr primarily a criminal lawyer, and the prosecution of offences now is so different to what it was even 20 years ago. And I don't think that the Kremlin understand the volume of evidence that is going to exist that would put the culpability of generals uh, beyond doubt. I mean, there were reports last week of um, Russian generals communicating with each other, and this is being monitored. So there won't be the usual, I didn't know, or I was following orders. They're complicit mm -hmm. in these criminal acts. And just before we, we came on, I was talking to, the, uh, to you all about, even aside from the International Criminal Court, many of these crimes are crimes within domestic law. And should war criminals find their way to be in Ireland, we would be looking to have them prosecuted here. Um, there is a call for the crime of aggression, which isn't currently before the International Criminal Court in the case of the Ukraine, to be made the subject of a special tribunal, which can be established. And a number of, of leading authorities have called for that. And that, that certainly is imaginative. The European Commission they are very energized about the crimes that are being committed within Europe and sanction breaking. And they have set up a season freeze task force which the European lawyers will participate in to give our advice and guidance so that the sanctions will bite and there will ultimately be a fund to rebuild the Ukraine. So, I mean, there are a lot of legal things that we can do and we want to do them. And um, I think you're possibly aware, there's a very established network of lawyers now to offer assistance to displaced Ukrainian people and particularly Ukrainian lawyers. And once that assistance is provided, the next step will be to secure the evidence that people can give. And will be people will have, unfortunately, we heard a report this morning that there was a man shot because he had um, footage on his camera, but not all the cameras will be seized. Some of them will be available. And then we are trained to secure evidence and to put it together in um, a, a way that shows it's not tainted. Um, I've asked for some assistance from Claire Loftus, our most recent director of public prosecutions, and our deputy, uh, Barry Donoghue, both of whom have retired recently, and they're checking with the International Association of Prosecutors so that we get this absolutely right. And we've offered assistance to Kareem Khan. He's being cautious about it at the moment because I think, un understandably, he does not want to be getting assistance from people who might be perceived to have already taken a prejudiced view. Mm -hmm. He might be better getting it from state parties. But there are plenty of things we can do to assist outside of that. Thank you so much, James. It's great to hear so much about what what can be done and the, who you're, the people that you're calling on and the skills that you're calling on and to, to do what can be done to help. Is there, is there a role for the European Convention on Human Rights in the, in the conflict and how are its um, principles being impacted? Gary? Um, so, well, well Russia, Russia is a party to the, the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, however, as part of the sanctions imposed on Russia, it, it, was, it was expelled from the Council of Europe on the 16th of March, I think. Um, and it's actually the first time that a member state of the Council of Europe was ever, uh, was ever expelled, expelled. As a consequence of this, um, Russia will cease to be uh, known as a, as a, cease to be a, a high contracting party. I think that's the term that's used right. in the, in the uh, European Convention. Um, and uh, as of the 22nd of September uh, next, um, any complaints, that, that come in after that won't be uh, won't won't be heard uh, or received apparently. Um, so any complaints in relation to the breaches of the European Convention on Human Rights have to be lodged uh, by the twenty second of September. There's, there's also an argument uh, to be made that the the the, the ECHR um, might actually not apply to, to to Russia from the date of its of its expulsion. Um, so, so given this, I suppose the, the, the jury is out as to whether or not uh, it was wise to have uh, to, to have expelled um, Russia. Um, but uh, in, in terms of breaches of the of the European Convention on Human Rights, there have been these widespread reports of, of ongoing violations 
um, in terms of the, the right to life, family life, property rights, health care, education, um, appalling reports of, of executions, torture, rape, and, and so on. I mean, it just it, it, everything, everything has been, has, has been, has been breached and violated. Um, and, and they're all matters that, that would uh, come within the, the, the jurisdiction of the European Court of, of Human Rights, with, with that caveat that, you know, probably only up until the 22nd of, of, of September uh, of, of this year. Thank you, Gary. And I'm going to ask about the um, Temporary Protection Directive. And before I ask about Ireland's application of the Temporary Protection Directive, Julia, would you mind telling us about your own particular personal um, experience and perspective in relation to the directive? Yes, Michelle, thank you. And of course, I am very thankful to the entire legal community because once the war started, we received many uh, letters, messages from the lawyers around the world and everyone um, proposed assistance to Ukrainian lawyers, personal assistance with accommodation and travel and support. And for all of that, we are extremely, extremely grateful. Speaking about temporary protection, um, my daughter is Danish and expecting the war, I sent her out to Denmark one month before the war actually started because she has Danish passport and Danish citizenship. So I didn't uh, see my daughter for a month and a half before I was managed, um, before I managed to reunite with her in Denmark again. I sent her out to Denmark, she is seven years old and I stayed in Kiev uh, in order to work with my colleagues, with my team on the ground as long as possible. I said it in the start that we have to stay and support Ukrainian economy and to keep working and contributing into Ukrainian economy as long as physically possible. On the 24th of February, I woke up because missiles hit Kyiv and we all heard the big explosions um, around us at 5 a.m. So uh, we, of course, uh, told our colleagues um, not to go to the office yeah. and uh, consider relocation options to the West. Many of them were able to relocate on the same day, on the 24th of February, and I did the same. And those who didn't want to, to do so and stayed in Kiev, they were relocated later by the firm. We managed to find the safe route for them. It took for me four days to get to the Polish border because the entire Ukraine looked like a complete traffic jam, especially if you wanted to go Western direction. So I was driving the car without any sleep for four days in a row to get to the border and cross the border by car. So, and then when I was already in the European Union in Poland, I also spent there a week helping Ukrainian refugees with accommodation, food, and I helped um, four small babies, one and two years old, as well as their mothers to cross the border between uh, Ukraine and Poland. They only had Ukrainian national passports. They didn't have mm -hmm. foreign passports. So I had to translate them into English and then from English to Polish to put them into the system and assist with some paperwork. After all of that was done, I finally a month and a half later got to my daughter in Denmark who is seven years old. And as she is in Denmark due to her citizenship now, mm -hmm. as we cannot live in Ukraine, I applied for a temporary protection status in Denmark because I wanted to be able to stay in Denmark more than 90 days and to be able to stay with my seven-year-old daughter as long as necessary. So basically, all EU countries uh, had a very good approach for the Ukrainian citizen who needed temporary protection. All of them said that uh, Ukrainian citizens need, need to meet only two requirements, which is Ukrainian passport and um, confirmation that they left the country after the 24th of February. Mm. 
Um, those two um, criteria were sufficient to submit an application. And three weeks later, I um, received um, a residence permit, which allows me now to work in the EU if I want to do some work here and allows uh, me to stay uh, for two years without any additional measures. The question from legal standpoint, which arises is what happens to those Ukrainians who left Ukraine before the 24th of February, because some of Ukrainian lawyers were traveling on business abroad. And so they left earlier and it's a bit of a gray area because it's not quite clear how they will be viewed by the authorities in each um, country. The, and the question is, which is somewhat vague, is uh, what happens to people who had residence status in Ukraine, but mm -hmm. were not Ukrainian citizens. I think their protection is also somewhat more complicated based on this directive. And of course, we are um, hugely thankful to Ireland for waiving right away all visas for Ukrainian citizens. That's how my partner Anna is traveling to Ireland right now as we speak, because at least in these times of immense challenges, she didn't have to go through long and complicated visa procedures. So for that, we are also extremely thankful. Yulia, thank you so much. You couldn't have brought it to life better. Um, Gary, can you talk about um, the situation for people who were resident in Ukraine but not Ukrainian nationals or otherwise give us insight into the temporary protection directive? Yeah, yeah, and uh, it is, uh, thanks again to Yulia for sharing the, the, her personal experience there. It, as you said, President, it does, it, it does bring reality to, to, to the situation. Um, yeah, as, as Yulia was explaining it there, so I won't get into what the, the EU directive is because she has mm -hmm. she has explained yes. it. Um, but uh, there is not, I understood in Ireland it was for one year, Yulia mentioned a two year period. Um, but um, I, so I'm just questioning questioning that. And I, I know there's, there's a, there is a process then to, to apply to have it extended um, after, after the, the, the initial period um, has, uh, ha has elapsed. Um, we have a hub in uh, Dublin Airport to, that's set up to receive and process um, people coming in, uh, fleeing the, the, the war in Ukraine. Um, and then you, you're, you're, given a, you're given a letter um, confirming your, your residency uh, pursuant to the, the temporary protective uh, directive. Um, in relation to non-Ukrainian non uh, nationals, uh, can the situation is is a bit more complicated for them so the people that are that 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 will qualify for it are ukrainian citizens who lived in ukraine uh, before the, the 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 24th of february uh, 2022 um people who had refugee status um in ukraine so non non ukrainian citizens citizens there that had um refugee status they they'll qualify for it as well Stateless people as well who lived in Ukraine uh, before the, the, the 24th um, of February 2022. Um, again, it might be difficult, difficult for, for people to prove uh, to prove this, particularly you know, if you're if you're stateless and you're it, so it can be it can be quite difficult. And of course, then family members of everybody that qualifies to come in to um, to Ireland provided. Um, they were they were living in uh, in Ukraine uh, before the twenty fourth of, of February, twenty two. Um, so there are issues obviously around uh, around yeah. that that strict uh, cut off uh, date. Thank you, Gary. James, is there anything you want to add there? Well, well, just on the, on the, the very net point of having established um, yourself in another country, how do we get to have you in a position to work with your professional qualification as a lawyer? So our training committee are looking at a methods of using the old mutual recognition systems because Ukraine, until they get into the European Union and it's our national policy, as you know, that you should be expedited and brought in as quickly as possible. But if the Polish lawyers, for instance, can, under existing mutual recognition, recognize a Ukrainian lawyer as a Polish lawyer, then they're a U European lawyer. And then we could recognize them as a registered European lawyer. And Richard Hammond and T.P. Kennedy from our Law Society uh, Education Committee have been involved in this, and but the goodwill is everywhere. People want colleagues to be able to uh, work and support the families. 
we have a dedicated website on which there will be a contact facility where people who are prepared to give employment to European or to Ukrainian colleagues will be able to, they can contact each other through that means. But the ambition is to ensure that the qualifications are recognised for what they're worth. Thank you, James. I'm going to ask people to keep the next answer short because there are questions coming up on screen and the, your answers are so amazing and comprehensive, but I want to cover a few, a few more points if you, if you don't mind. Um, so can I ask, is there a benefit to Ireland utilising universal jurisdiction to take steps to prosecute crimes against humanity? Yes. You think, James, you're nodding there? The alternative would be to shelter war criminals. OK, well, that's pretty blunt. I'm not going to ask more about that because that is very clear. How can lawyers help to ensure compliance with sanctions? Can I think I'll ask um, Yulia if you can tell me about what you have been doing. And then I'm going to ask James to come in from the CCB perspective. Yes. So in Ukraine, we also coordinated efforts um, between various law firms and various lawyers in order to share the information on sanctions and also we spent a lot of time on identifying global companies which refused to stop business in Russia mm -hmm. and wanted to continue their business in Russia. Those global companies like Oshan, a big food retailer from France, or Tuborg um, beer producer from Netherlands, they were planning to continue operations in Russia, basically mm. funding the war until they received huge pressure from legal uh, and financial society in Ukraine. People said that um, basically they would not be buying any products uh, of those companies in Ukraine yeah. if they um, don't stop businesses in Russia. And recently it was proposed also to um, develop a law in Ukraine, which would stipulate that companies doing business in Russia uh, would pay 50% more taxes. So basically we tried to use economic ways to stimulate them to leave Russia. Thank you. And James, can I ask you both from CCBE and I think from your knowledge of our money laundering um, re regime or system in Ireland as well, please. Yeah, we're not starting from an ideal place because not every member state has criminalised sanction breaking in the same yeah. way. And in some cases, it's regulatory rather than criminal. So the main point to make is sanction breaking may also be other criminal offences of money laundering without there ever having been a sanction in place in the first place. Uh, we have a very good website section. This is the Blood Side of Ireland put together by Emma Jane Williams, pointing out how complicated this is. People need to take uh, advice if they have any question at all about whether they can act in a particular matter. At our last Law Society Council meeting, a colleague was able to say that a Russian firm who were being turned away from one law firm were prepared to try and incentivize representation, um, which obviously is, is, is to bribe them. The CCBE message is that um, we've long since come to accept that money laundering is a criminal offence and colleagues who get involved in it are, should not be colleagues. So they'll get no sympathy or protection or support. And Commissioner Reinders attended our meeting on last Friday, has very strong views. There will be regulations which will be automatically effective to strengthen this whole area. And it may take a decade to get the prosecutions in the International Criminal Court, but it might only take months to get prosecutions for money laundering in the context of sanction breaking. And we've already suggested that the European public prosecutor's powers might be expanded to use their resources in this area, because this is damaging the financial interests of the European Union, without a doubt. Thank you, James. And can I ask you, um, Gary, first of all, how can lawyers continue to provide access to justice in a conflict? Well, I think uh, during a conflict, uh, access to justice, uh, for obvious reasons, uh, is severely curtailed. Uh, martial law measures, for example, uh, are usually implemented. And uh, usual safeguards can be set uh, aside um, as the immediate concerns, you know, around the the, the basics of, of survival. Um, but even even though those access to justice uh, access to justice might be might be curtailed, uh, lawyers can can play a part. And I just wanted to focus in uh, just in terms of of war crimes that have been perpetrated on on individuals. 
the importance to get in there and 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 gather and gather the evidence um, to make room for 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 investigation and perhaps the the, the role that law, that lawyers uh, could play in, in in relation to that, whether they're in Ukraine or in Ireland. Yeah, itself as as people come into uh, into Ireland that we can play a, a role as as lawyers here um but if you are taking um uh, statements from um alleged um, victims or, or survivors um you know you to make sure you get the, the basics right um make sure you have informed consent from the victim uh, so that they know why why a statement is being made what it might be used for any potential risks and um, refer them to appropriate support services um, and it's really important for any survivor to have full control over their own experience as well um, and, and to understand and that, that, that the, the justice system. Um, and I think as a lawyer, we should always listen uh, with, with empathy um, and patience uh, to, to anybody who's, who's um, an alleged victim or, or, or survivor. And recognise as well that not every survivor might want to pursue a case. Yeah. They just might want to forget about it, and that should be respected as well. So, and ensure confidentiality and that data will, will, will be retained. I no more press for time this anymore, President. Thank you very much, Gary. And Yulia, I think you've been working on this, on documenting and taking evidence. Is that right? Yes, uh, indeed. First of all, uh, many lawyers on the ground now collect evidence of war crimes mm -hmm. and to make them objective. Ukrainian government invited observers from the international organizations and international media representatives so that everything that happened on the ground, including genocide against Ukrainian population, which took place in Bucha, Irpin, Borodyanka, and those uh, other suburbs of Kiev, that it is documented and verified independently, not only by the representatives of the Ukrainian side, mm. which are our lawyers, our police forces, but also by international community. And in addition to that, uh, some um, uh, photos made by satellites were also released because Russia tried to say that Ukrainians killed their own people to condemn Russia, which is not true. And even um, satellites data uh, supports the evidence that those dead bodies were already lying on the grounds in those cities uh, under Russian occupations two weeks before Ukraine, Ukrainian government re-established control over those cities. So now we are trying to collect uh, all evidence from all sources, including satellites, data, and evidence on the ground. And uh, we welcome all representatives of international organizations and media sources to actively participate in this process from the start to make it objective and eligible as an evidence for international court institutions. Thank you very much. Can I make a brief, um, practical, yes, please brief, yeah. very brief practical point, President? Before the pandemic, we probably wouldn't have been thinking the way we're thinking now. But here is an example of Yulia is in Denmark. She could be interpreting for a Ukrainian non-English speaking person being interviewed by a lawyer in Dublin. The entire exercise could be filmed on a smartphone so that it would never be suggested at a later stage that a witness was pressurized or words were put in their mouth or they didn't understand what was going on. So one of the things we were working on is trying to establish a network of available interpreters because they don't have to be in Ireland. They yeah. could be in Poland and willing to help. So that, that, that would make it much easier. Thank you, James. And that's an, an unintended small positive consequence of the pandemic insofar as there could be any positive consequence that we are all equipped to work from everywhere and Yulia, you're certainly testing that. There are some small, we've we dealt with a lot of the questions that are coming through um, address matters that you have all then spoken about as we have progressed on. So the questions now are, are somewhat more of a practical perspective um, and being asked, um, Chris Owen is asking, Yulia, what type of secondment are you looking for? Is it limited to junior professionals and for how long? Uh, yeah, I, I actually, I'm happy to share the view of the entire Ukrainian mm. legal society. Uh, and um, all law firms said unanimously that they are ready to provide not only junior law lawyers, but mid-level lawyers and senior lawyers 
to international law firms uh, within yeah. the government arrangements. Basically, junior lawyers are quite um, dependent on the Ukrainian mentors, but okay. mid-level lawyers and senior lawyers, they are independent and they have expertise to work quite independently on cross-border projects, not only involved in Ukraine or not ne necessarily involved in Ukraine. So and this be discussed on case-by-case -case basis, but yeah. generally all um, levels of seniority are available for secondment. Thank you. And Graham Kenny has asked, I think you mentioned when we were talking beforehand, you mentioned this to me, is there still a functioning court system in Ukraine? And now some courts, only some work online. Some uh, judges were able to return to Ukraine and some uh, refused to return to Ukraine. Basically, they are female judges with children. They think it's not safe for the children to be in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So their working opportunities are quite limited now because they feel like refugees abroad, where they have to take care of everything, find schools for their children and do the rest. So they cannot consider cases um, in a um, okay. in a, a proper manner. And that's why those judges who managed to find ways to work remotely, they can see the cases, but not all of them. Okay, I'm going to ask you some very quick questions then. One is that Joe Noonan is asking if you can recommend any effective charitable groups on the ground in Kiev or elsewhere in Ukraine that we can send funds to because there are so many groups. And another point um, Mary Garrick is raising is, is there a benevolent fund for lawyers and how would that work for you and your colleagues? So you might deal with those together, Yulia, as far as you can. Yeah, I'm thinking maybe I should just uh, send all details um, yeah, after the, the last mail, because there are different ways to help and different yeah. groups uh, take care of different areas. So uh, I already have everything in writing and they'll share those uh, details. So their I, think, accounts. I think that would be more efficient. Well, look, I, this... I, I have been just blown away by the quality of the contributions from Yulia, from James and from Gary and the, the, also the excellent questions that have come um, from those attending the webinar. Um, I, I want to thank all of you for sharing such interesting and moving um, insights and uh, to James and Gary and Yulia, please, I hope that you and all, all your family stay safe and we wish you all the very best. And before we close, I'd like to just give a brief update of how the Law Society of Ireland has responded so far in solidarity with the people of Ukraine. So in addition to our statement condemning the, the invasion, the flag flying outside, the building is blue and yellow at night, um, we, we endorsed the statement by the CCBE and we've worked closely with James in relation to that. And we've created a dedicated Ukraine hub on our website to signpost to information that relates to the profession and how our members and trainees can show their support. So would you give us, Julia, be useful for that as well? We've also created a sanctions hub on the website, which has comprehensive information on the latest sanctions against Russia and Belarus and how solicitors can ensure compliance. And then our members and trainees have also responded with the collegiality that is the bedrock of our profession. For example, trainees recently held a fundraiser walk for the Irish Red Cross Ukraine crisis appeal and the international way to the Irish Women Lawyers Association had a, an event here, which had fundraised for the Red Cross. And um, the Law Society's EU and International Affairs Committee is hosting a table quiz here in Blackpool Place on the 21st of April for the Irish Red Cross. And that's not to mention the many emails and letters and phone calls that we have received. I've received so many here, and I, I know Gary and, and James and others have too, from, in, from individual solicitors and firms who want to show their support. So thank you all so very much. And that concludes our webinar. Thank you, everybody, for your, engage, your attendance and your engagement today. And I wish you so very well.